You might know how the story already goes, but if you don't... Imagine you were walking around and minding your own business, probably walking back home from school or work, and then a horse carriage tramples you to death. The next thing you know, you feel trapped in an enclosed space, like a coffin. You hear someone shaking the coffin, your eyes meet with a cat raccoon thing. In short, after that, that thing breathes fire and chases you around, trying to kill you. You meet this mysterious being called Dyer Crowley, who is apparently the school principal of this place. and. He can't get you back home, and instead lets you stay in a broken down house. You are then subjected to a series of unfortunate events, and for some reason, you are always at the scene of an overblot, which is basically going full on villain mode. Why is that? The time loop theory is the most popular due to how convincing and believable it is. The basis of this theory starts at the very beginning of the game when you first download the app. You see the POV of someone who is believed to be Crowley walking towards a mirror that resembles the talking dark mirror in Snow White. Then you see a hand in the mirror. That scene transitions into a character selection screen where you first pick your card. We then go back to Crowley in the dark mirror chamber and he talks about the different types of magic that exist. For example, fire, ice, and nature, but not void for some reason. That leads us to our first tutorial, which teaches us the battle mechanics of the game. You get to fight this Chimera-like monster with blue fire with the character you just picked and other allies. No matter what you do, you will always lose against this monster because of its high HP. The Chimera is the most important and solid evidence. Doesn't it look a lot like Grimm, but if he was actually a threatening monster? What if this was his overblot form? It would make sense since Grimm has been eating the black stones after each overblot fight like the gremlin he is. And if we take a closer look, we can see parts of this chimera actually relate to some of the overblot forms we fought. It has these black ink tentacles which resemble Azul's overblot form. The cobra tail is a reference to Jamil's. The dragon winds is definitely coming from Malleus. It has a blue fire mane like a lion, so that may be a reference to Leona. This is a bit of a stretch, but the blue fire can resemble also Idia. As for references for Riddle, Vil, and the dwarf monster, I'm not too sure. And I couldn't really find anything on the internet except someone saying that the human hands on the Chimera could relate to Vil, which I don't think that relates to Vil as there wasn't a hand motif in his over platform. I'd argue it was more of a queen or a peacock motif. The point is, that is definitely grim from the near future, and it looks like we are going to fight him in the ruins of the mirror chamber. We go back to the scene with Crowley again, and he says the following words that you might want to remember for later on. And that's where the game begins. Was Crowley telling us to go back in time to save the world from Overblock Grimm? Side note, that is definitely Crowley's voice actor. We could just say that there are two different characters and it's just Crowley's VA doing a uh, narration, but that seems inconsistent to me. Also, for those that doubt it is Crowley's VA, here's a voice comparison. Kewashkutsurai 
マスターシェフに参加する皆さん、準備はよろしいですか Us going back in time would make sense if that's the case. We can consider that whenever Overblock Grimm defeated the cast, it would reset the time loop. Do you think Crowley knows about the timeline? I mean, he did say those words to us. Or perhaps he was talking to the Dark Mirror to bring us here and swore it to secrecy. Would that make him the mastermind? Or were those the last words of Crowley from a previous timeline before the world ended? Let's go on the assumption that Crowley does know he sent us back in time. This would make his little silly moments actually on purpose. Oh! Oh! Moto no sekai ni modoru ho ho ne? Ahaha! Ya desu ne! Chanto sangai shite imasu tomo! He's the mastermind behind it all and is inducing the overbots. Masaka, dare ka ka jinyi de ki ni overblot to yuhatsu sase te iru? Crowley is often not very involved with saving the students from overblot or preventing them. If anything, he's the one who pushes MC into these predicaments that gets them closer to said overblots. He's the one who suggested the duel with Riddle for Ace. He's the one who demanded you to be- help investigate the mysterious accidents that Leona and Ruggy were causing. He's also the one who gave us a phone over winter vacation and then proceeded to ignore us in book four. He's the one who forced us to have the dance training camp in Ramshackle so we could be closer to Ville. Like, it's hard not to see him being the mastermind behind all of this. Or just a really irresponsible adult. But still, maybe he knows what's going on, and hence he's actually just making sure that everything falls into place off screen. And also, of course, Explains why he is not looking for a way back home for us. The way we met Grimm and Crowley has all types of mystery around it. How could Grimm get past the magical barrier that Crowley worked hard in upping the security for? He's either low key powerful or Crowley is the one who let him in. Or Crowley infiltrated or has connections to Styx and got one of the frozen phantom boxes or it got onto campus grounds in another way right before the entrance ceremony. But I highly doubt that since Styx is known for its security. Hold on, let's think about this more. Maybe Crowley does have connections to Styx, and these connections can go back to like a hundred years ago when Styx was just new. Because Crowley, despite the game not outright saying it, has f a y e like features, and f a y e s can live for a very long time. It would make sense on how he got away with not getting fired as a headmaster after so many students overblotted. I mean, he did end up going to the court in book six, and then Idiot's parents, the head of Styx, ended up letting him go with no punishment due to lack of evidence and on the condition he lets Idiot and Ortho continue being students. As parents, why didn't Idiot's father and mother demand for a new headmaster after having five students overblot? Did they just arrest him for show? Just like. To keep people off their back? This theory also opens up to the possibilities that Crowley could have access to the Lethe River of Styx system that erases people's memory. Who could say he didn't use it on Grimm? After all, he doesn't remember anything about his past or where he came from. If this was the case, he could have had access to the VR system, otherwise called the Lachesis system. A quick Greek mythology fact. Lachesis is the name of one of the three fates that determines someone's fate and lifespan via the thread of life. This opens up the possibility that he may have used it on us to show us that flashback or future where Grimm overblotted. Also, it wouldn't be too far fetched to say that Grimm was an experiment made a long time ago by one of Idia's ancestors. Hard to ignore the blue flames coming out of his ears, and it oddly resembles the Shroud families. その線で術の解析を試みたけどはかなり複雑な魔法が重ね掛けされてて全体像がつかめないスティークスの保有するスーパーコンピューターの処理能力を持ってしても解析し終わるまでに100年かかりそうだよ重ねてある魔法の浅
Well, if we take a look at the album of NRC, it has three keys. Two of them look like they overblotted. So in the previous time lamps, NRC's emblem could have had only two keys, and then the other one could have had one key. Also, at the end of book four, Mickey states he had the same dream three times. Playing cards and dancing music boxes are all the same. This logic kind of matches up with how the vignettes and events are written. The ceremonial robes vignettes for Ace and Appel, for example, they both take place during the entrance ceremony. However, how could Appel sneak out with Ace and be yelled at by Ville during the entrance ceremony at the same time? Many speculate that one, the entrance ceremony was super long, or two, one vignette took place in the first timeline, the other in the second timeline, and then us causing chaos took place in the current timeline. As for the events, the events seem not to make much sense when you try to put them in a timeline. For example, we have the Halloween event for them in NRC, then the next, they spend their Halloween at Nobel College and meet Rolo. The masquerade Halloween wasn't next year, because if it was, then Leona, Cater, Trey, Idia, Malleus, Rook, and Lilia, and any of the third years that I forgot to mention would have already graduated. But they are still here, celebrating Halloween. If we were to actually give meaning to these events, timings, and not mark them off as not canon, then this highly suggests that there are multiple timelines. There's a timeline where the first you celebrating Endless Halloween, and then there's a second you in another timeline celebrating the Masquerade event. Also, these events are without a doubt somewhat canon to the main story. Example, in Harvest Storm, you meet the Seven Dwarves, and Appel and Rook refer to the happenings of Book 5, and see this uh, sled competition as a way to get their lick back. And now, how likely is this an actual time loop? What if it was just a dream shown to us like the Disney movies we see in the other chapters? Well, we did have a canon time loop that happened. The first Halloween event, Endless Halloween. The boys were stuck in an endless loop until they solved the situation. There's also a possibility that what we saw in the prologue is just another one of you's visions, like how they always get those Disney movie dreams with the mirrored animation, except in the prologue we went through the dark mirror, or the twist of uh, showing you a bit of what's to come to keep the players intrigued in the story. Obviously one fault about this argument is, oh my gosh, no, that can't be a vision because all of you's visions so far were from the Disney movies and Grimm isn't from a Disney movie. Well, have you ever thought that maybe they didn't dream about a Disney movie because they weren't in Twister Waterland yet? And thus, it still counts because when you was dreaming about the Disney movies in Twist, those movies were in an alternate universe, which is uh, the world that you came from. Therefore, you having visions of a Dire Beast Grimm can happen because they could have been still on Earth at the time and Twister Wonderland is an alternate universe, so they were just having visions of an alternate universe. Damn. <laughs> also, I would like to point out in the Twist novel, during the prologue, they describe the tutorial section of you and others fighting overblotted Grimm like they were actually there experiencing the destruction so it could also not have been a dream and they actually died in the previous timeline a stretch manga and novels talk about different use compared to the game you supporting the theory that there are different timelines and crowley just keeps pulling in randoms from earth to twist in wonderland and hopes that one of them will save the planet i don't want to believe that he is that heartless and irresponsible um but you never know Hopefully not. <laughs> Another argument is if the time loop exists, why hasn't Crowley let Grimm die early on? I mean, it will save the world, even though it's really grim. Is it because when time resets, he doesn't remember that Grimm is a threat? And what about the other people besides Crowley who saw him interacting with a plot that could lead to bad news? I mean, Leona brought it up as a question, but then promptly dropped it, seeing that Grimm wasn't a major threat. Any ran some experiments on Grimm and saw potential in the threat, but also decided to let him go. And Malleus and Lilia, two beings that are the most powerful in the entire student body of NRC, were totally oblivious to what Grimm was doing and not sensing any danger from him. The only one who really did anything was Amber Rose when he called the six pest control to come in and get him. <laughs> 
逆探知対策バッチリなところが怪しさ満載 Who knows about the time loop? Crowley? Yes! But there's a possibility it's a no. He could have had no memory of these loops, but he's too mysterious to not know either. So, yeah. Leona? Yes! Despite being a little brat, this little smart kitty knows and is very observant about his surroundings. If we remember about what happened in book six, he was able to notice something's off in the VR experiment very quickly. He also makes a comment about Grimm eating the stones and then probably traps the subject in book three. Some have interpreted that he knows, but he actually can't say anything because he's binded by the time loop. But I think he's just a smart cookie. This is also a bit of a stretch, but looking at Malleus in the official art with him in the coffins while everyone else is looking away or is in their coffin, Idia. Is doing this too. Him and Leona are looking at Malleus, so he could possibly also know, or it's perhaps he will be play a big role in Malleus's book and overplot, like how the others have. Silver. Yeah, in the dorm trailers, he mentions knowing us somewhere from before, meaning he either remembers you from a previous timeline where they failed or had the visions of future you. <laughs> Sulfur、so、does seem to have the ability to travel to different alternate universes or dreams, as he did visit Mickey in Book 6, so this possibility is not too far off. Trey? No! If you have Deuce's Dorm SSR card, you probably have read the vignette and know that Ace and Deuce are sleeping in Trey's room. There is a letter in Deuce's groovy art that was in Trey's room. People online transcribed it to say something, but I'm gonna be honest, this is gibberish. Like, it looks like the artist wrote whatever scrabble to make it look like a homework assignment that they were studying off of, and it looks like someone graded the assignment with the red pen and it says, Good, not let's groove.、Uh, sorry, folks, I'm debunging and calling this a false theory. Trey does not know a thing in the world. For a more detailed explanation on this theory, definitely go check out Princess Macaroon's YouTube channel. They have a couple videos on Ace. There are two people in Hearts of You that represent the suit of hearts in a deck of cards Riddle and Ace. Doesn't that repetition seem odd? What if one of them is a wild card? The Joker, I dare say. He is the only character from Hearts of You whose surname doesn't represent his card. We have Deuce Spade. Trey Clover, Cater Diamond, but not Ace Heart. Instead, he's named Trapola. In addition, Trapola is an old trick taking card game played in Central Europe. This game is also called Trapulka, Bulka, and Hunterspiel, and it is played with a special set of Italian suited cards. It can be played with two or four players, and the goal of the game is to get people to discard their best cards for worse ones. For the rap, which they call tricks for some reason. This was really hard to wrap my head around,、um, so please Google how the game is actually played because it was very hard for me to understand what was going on. I've never played a trick taking card game except like Old Maid, so this, this seems like Old Maid but with extra steps to me. But, anyways. One important thing to take away from this game is that its special set of Italian suited cards has a different ranking system, where the ace is higher in rank above the king, making it the most powerful card. In Alice Through the Looking Glass, the Jack of Hearts, who has a heart on his right eye, ends up portraying the Queen of Hearts trying to kill her. In the twist opening, we find a lot of foreshadowing of future events. We can see a bit of Azul's overblot, for example. In this opening, Ace appears alone along with Deuce, besides all the characters who are dorm leaders, making a distinction of him and Deuce being important characters who might have a bigger role to play. Also, at the beginning, he appears alone in a set of stairs, while the rest of Hearts of Blue is playing together, separating him from the group. He was the first trigger to setting off. All of the events of Overblot by coming into our house in Book One and provoking Grimm to the point of setting off chaotic chain events. <laughs> and leads us to finding the Overblot monster in the mines in the prologue. He tends to have extra consideration for you compared to the other characters as well. 
This could be excused as he's just a nice guy and really observant, but he didn't really understand why Deuce was so mad at him in book 5, so him being naturally observant doesn't seem to fit the bill. Sometimes his caring moments kind of come off as someone who's actually aware of what's happening to you, but I just like to think he actually does care about you. Deuce, it feels my um my delusional you may heart, okay? <laughs> Everyone is dead. <laughs> in order to get to the Twister Wonderland world, you have to be trampled to death by a horse carriage in your original world. What if that happened to everybody else? But the only reason why we remember it is because Grim woke us up a little bit earlier than usual during like the full soul transfer thing. Uh, while we're in the coffins. Could the reason why they can't return to home is because they're actually dead on Earth? And what does it say about the other students who woke up in their coffins? Are we perhaps the exception and remember our past lives on Earth because everyone else here doesn't? Could that explain why we are magicless? Because we simply remember? Many arguments can be made against this, however. It's a pretty weak theory. Like, the boys are still interacting with their family relatives and they have their own little history so they can't really just like not remember anything unless everybody and their family members are dead that'd be hell of us also there's another layer to this. there's ghosts roaming around everyone would be ghosts and like the ghosts that we see in the game is just like a different type of ghost and it's just like it's too many stretches too many stretches aka the light magic trio they're called that because their void magic is manifested with light aura. Also in the Platinum cards, Rook is seen doing a genuine smile and not an evil face like the other boys have been doing to their paintings. That leaves for room for a possibility that Silver and Kaleem will also do a genuine smile in their groovy arts. There's also the fact that they are not based on villains. Either good or neutral characters. Rook is based on the hunter who's bared and saved Snow White. Silver is a mix of the Sword of Truth and Sleeping Beauty. And Cleam is based on Jasmine's father, the Sultan. But there can be an argument made that, okay, uh, Ace, Deuce, they're pretty neutral characters. They're only just soldiers, right? Um, they only were following the Queen's orders. There's also a Pell who's just literally an apple. And Lilia, Lilia is based off of their fairies, but he's still evil. <laughs> So that evidence kind of has a weak argument. Silver is kind of like a special case as well, because he's literally a parallel to Malleus. The most noticeable I feel like is in their Halloween card. The way they visualize the two against each other heavily suggests that one is the hero, which is in this case Silver, and the other one is the villain, Malleus. If you don't know what Epic Mickey is, it's another game made by Junction Point Studios. The game starts out in Mickey's bedroom and he enters the magic mirror, finds a mini model of the forgotten creations living in a city created by some wizard. He then spills magic ink over it, as he creates a monster called the Shadow Blot, and now that monster haunts the world. And you spent most of the game trying to save the inhabitants of Wasteland, the name of the alternate world that Mickey spilled magic paint all over. It's hard not to ignore the similarities in terms of plot. Both games take place in an alternate world with old Disney characters. Both have a magic mirror in the bedroom that shows them another world. Sidetrack, one of the strong evidence for this theory is that the Ramshackle's layout looks a lot like Epic Mickey's room. However, a lot of people also say that Ramshackle looks a lot like the room featured in the 1936 Disney short film, Through the Mirror. I wouldn't put it past Disney if Epic Mickey also referenced this short. This film also features Mickey having the dream about living cards in a dancing music box, which is what he mentions at the end of book 4. This also confirmed in the first Twisted Wonderland fanbook, saying that Ramshackle is directly inspired by Through the Mirror. End of sidetrack. Both games have black ink like features. Epic Mickey has the shadow blot, and we have Phantom's the mini versions. Unless one of the boys decide to overblot. Both Mickey and you come from another world and defeat Blot in order to rescue the world. Also kind of a spoiler for Epic Mickey, so skip to this time on the screen if you don't want to hear it. 
Okay, so for those who didn't skip around the finale, Mickey gives his heart to Shadowblot in order to save his friends in Wasteland, which was Shadowblot's ulterior motive the entire time. If Shadowblot got a hold of Mickey's heart, he can use Mickey's heart to cross into the real world and cause chaos. And just like whenever the boys overblot, when their magic pens turned black, the same thing happened to Mickey's heart. It turned black. But don't worry, they managed to defeat the blot and Mickey got his heart back again. So I think Mickey may be an extension to Twisted Wonderland. Some people theorize Twisted Wonderland is the same world as Wasteland and it's what the world is like after many years. Me personally, I think that's a huge stress to say. There isn't enough evidence for me to say that this is the same world and Mr. Shadow plot is still lurking around. It definitely has enough similarities that it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that the twist staff were at least inspired by Epic Mickey, however. So if you don't know about your sea animals, here are some fun facts. Octopuses have really great vision for aquatic animals. Eels have poor to no vision. So how come Azul is wearing glasses, but Jade and Floyd aren't wearing glasses? So if we think about it, Azul's unique magic make a deal is used to take powers from other people, but it can be used to give. For example, in book four, Floyd traded his unique magic for a deeper voice. So Azul giving them eyesight isn't too far off, but the question is, what did he get in return? He did recognize there was something off at the stage. He could have also been the one that carried us back to the dorm after he got attacked by Grimm, but it, we could have also just woke up walked up to the dorm by ourselves, cold doozy days, and passed out. Anyways, in book 6, Idiot mentioned that they got an anonymous tip from someone. This could also possibly support the idea that Crowley has connections to Sticks. Because if Amber Rose contacted them from the Land of Dawning, it could imply that the Headmasters and the government is in contact with Sticks. In book two, Ruggie was the one who used a large amount of magic like Riddle did with the help of a potion from Azul. The potion is supposed to amplify one's unique magic, but it was never stated that it prevents overblot. Right after Ruggie used the stampede, he was a little crazy. <laughs> laughing like a maniac and well he was under the stress of doing Leona's bidding for weeks on end and he was using his unique magic to injure other magic left players nearly multiple times a day so people theorized that Ruggie was the perfect candidate to overblot but Leona being observant and aware of Ruggie's conditions if you want to connect it to another theory is aware of the time loop and steps in. Some think he made a deal with Azul so that all the block goes to him instead of Ruggie. Others think he did something as simple as switching magic stones with Ruggie. I mean, him switching or going out of his way to do this kind of fits the bill for Leona because he actually deeply cares for his juniors and friends. He would never put Ruggie in danger. But um, as we can see in book two, he, he did. <laughs> but it could have been an act. It could have been an act, you guys. You never know. Idian Book 6 also states how he doesn't understand why Leona and Bill and Jamil overblotted considering how well they performed in the VR experiments and even suggesting it was artificially caused. But then he disregards that, that idea, saying it's impossible. Now, this theory would be solid if Leona didn't use a lot of magic and just had a lot of emotional buildup, but he did use a lot of magic. I mean, in book two, after he was like ranting and found out that his plan failed, he summoned a literal sandstorm and used his unique magic after being told he was trash. <laughs> he was in so much emotional distress that it accelerated his blot. Also, it was never addressed that switching magic stones is possible, but I think it is because of what happened during a camping event. It seemed they could just grab any magic stone. No magic stone was really assigned to someone. I mean, this kind of makes sense, right? It's in his third year. It makes sense if he was uh, second year last year and was a house warden and then lost to Riddle. 
uh, because Riddle was a freshman. And they also said the previous house warden uh, was very loose with the rules, and that definitely fits the bill for someone's personality type like Cater's. Obviously, this theory isn't very solid, because if it was the case, why wouldn't Riddle, Cater, or Trey mention it? This totally seems like what Cater would brag about too, but uh, then maybe again, uh, maybe he's embarrassed to admit he lost to Riddle when he was a freshman. Who knows, it could have been one of those hidden trivias that we find out later on, like how we didn't find out about Rook originally being in Savannah Claw and then transferring to Pompiori. <laughs> There are 22 main characters and 22 tarot cards. These tarot cards can predict how the characters will develop in the future and possibly the happy ending that Twist talks so much about. It seems like a lot of the unique magic and personality and character motivations can be linked back to the tarot cards or inspired by the tarot cards that they are assigned. So you can read cards in either the upright position or the reverse position, and they have different meanings based on that. So for people that use light magic when casting void, like Kaleem, Silver, and Rook, you will use the normal upright position for them. Those that use the dark magic when they cast void will have their tarot cards in the reverse position. So I really liked this interpretation, and I'm going to be using this uh, during the tarot card pickings that I picked out of all the theories I read. So this one was the hardest to research due to so many different interpretations. Some analyze and assign the cards while others use the countdown to assign the tarot cards. I decided to pick the card assignments that made the most sense to me. For other assignments and analysis, please check the sources down below in the video description. So yeah, let's get started. Okay, so the very first one is The Fool, and I am assigning this to Ace Trapula. So The Fool is a freedom card. It shows a traveler traveling wherever his thoughts take him. However, there is no road ahead, and the dog is trying to tell the fool this, but it doesn't seem to notice, so it will die. <laughs> Uh, in the reverse position, freedom backfires, so if you act too freely, you will lose the trust of those around you. Another interpretation is that it is unstable and a lonely state where one continues to wander without a fixed set destination or goal in life. So, also, this is kind of one of the most important cards in the deck besides the world, and that kind of fits Ace because he's the first guy we meet and his unique magic hasn't been revealed yet. Makes me feel like he'll play a bigger role for the future. Now, in terms of being freed and backfiring and losing the trust in those around you, I feel like that has happened in book one where he ate Riddle's tart and now Riddle doesn't really trust him. There's also, you know, this is going back to the traitor theory again, when really, oh my god. Him not being able to like lose trust or acting too freely and losing trust and betraying others kind of really fits the bill for the traitor theory again. Also, the fool has the same type of authority like the Joker in the deck of cards, interpreted as a trickster like the Joker or someone that might betray you. Uh, traitor theory, traitor theory, I really don't want the traitor theory to be real, you guys. But no joke, Ace has always been a trickster, and his brother is a magician. It's hard not to look at him as anything else but a prankster. And also in the reverse position, the fool is viewed as someone who is naive and a risk taker, very reckless, and someone who holds... Again, going back to the Ace trader theory, Ace could be hiding his true potential. The Magician is Azul Ashengrado. So the Magician is a creativity card. The club is in his right hand, the gold coins, the holy grail, and the sword is placed on the desk, and those four elements make up the universe. So magician means you can manipulate those items very freely and create anything. It could also mean you are a calculating person and may sometimes deceive others. And does that not sound like a zool to you? In reverse position, being aware of your creativity and your own imagination is negative for you, meaning you may have a vague sense of purpose, lack of confidence in your abilities in executing your creative ideas, or you may have ulterior motives for something very evil. <laughs> Azul is creative for sure when it comes to making money. This is shown many times throughout the story, vignettes and events, um, especially when it comes to his little monster lounge. Azul is very much a calculating person as well. He always has a plan and this was heavily shown in book 4. He successfully deceived Jamil to lower his guard and show his true potential with the plan of taking care of all of Jamil's duties and just getting him guard his guard down. 
ulterior motives that is azul and the octavenil in a nutshell when you look at them they they are basically a mafia gang there's like no other way to look at it <laughs> Now, the lack of confidence in your abilities part, in book 3, this was addressed a lot. Azul felt like he wasn't good enough uh, on his own. He was afraid to be the little chubby octopus that he was once was. And so he buried himself in other people's uh, unique magics and stole the best traits from other people to leverage himself to be the best ever, to never be that poor, unconfident octopus again. So this definitely fits the backstory for Azul too. In terms of uh, predicting the future, I don't really know what this card can predict except that it just really fits the bill. But maybe one day Azul will have the power to control everything <laughs> and that will play a role in the story. The High Priestess is Apel Filmir. The Priestess is a spirituality card. The crown she wears suggests nobility, the veal she wears suggests purity, and the color blue suggests calmness. And the holy book she holds in her hand suggests wisdom. The pillars uh, right next to each other are black and white. They're supposed to like represent contradictory things like light and, light and dark or conscious and unconsciousness or male and female. Together they make a sense of tension. In the reverse position, it can be interpreted as stubbornness, which Appel has a lot of. Think of his flashback in book 5 or his ceremonial robe a card with Vil. Appel does not like being told to do something for sure. He likes his way and his way only. In the reverse position, this card could also mean that one has cognitive dissonance. This really lines up to what Appel is. Appel is not in line with his femininity. His, he looks way more feminine than he actually feels like in the inside. In the inside, he wants to be the most masculine, manly man there is. But of course, that will cause a cognitive dissonance, which is one of the key words for being in the reverse position. Pell is very adamant on being someone masculine, but his looks are the complete opposite of that, and he views his feminine beauty as something negative, and he's stubborn about his ideal image. There is also a moon at her feet, which can later connect to Jack. I gave Jack the moon card, and you know, I feel like that that would be very fitting for Appel and Jack's relationship because they, they seem really close compared to the other freshmen. Also, you could also compare the pillars as one is Savannah Claw and one is Pompiore. One is Leona and one is Vil. Pell looks up, admires Leona and admires his masculinity and he despises that he was brought into this dorm and he despises Vil and his beauty and he hates being told to look more beautiful when really he wants to be more masculine. Uh, you know, as the story goes on, we see him try to come into terms with that and we see him take his femininity in his own power, in his own regard. The Empress is Vil Shen Haito. So the Empress is a card of abundance. In the card, you see a woman with a gentle expression and she's surrounded by lots of nature. Uh, she's a little chubby and it could be you know maybe she's pregnant and it can be seen that she is abundant in every way mentally physically you can see the symbol of venus is drawn in a heart shape item next to her and that can mean love beauty fruitfulness and is a symbol of abundance however in the reverse position her abundance can become lacking some key words for the reverse position is insecurities, overbearing, uh, negligence, smothering, lack of growth, lack of progress. And then, of course, in the upright position, define feminine, uh, sensuality, fertility, nurturing, creativity, beauty, abundance, and nature. Both positions can really apply to Vil. For example, in book five, Vil turned a scene down because he didn't want to be a typecast. Vil has a stoic personality towards himself, making his confidence about his beauty not something out of selfishness or arrogance. However, he has the tense desire to be number one, the ideal goal he tries to get, but he seems to be uh, lacking in progress in getting that number one. He is always fed up being the second and the villain in his movies and films that he's chosen for. Also in Japanese, Bill tends to use feminine pronouns compared to the other boys, which fits into his femininity of the Empress. The Emperor is Leona Kingscar and it's a social card. Preposition 
It is stability, structure, protection, authority, control, practicality, focus, and discipline. In the reverse uh, position, it stands for a tyrant, demurring, rigid, stubborn, lack of discipline, recklessness. As you can see in the card, it has a king um, from some country uh, who overcame various hardships and achieved his position because he was recognized by those around him. In the reverse position, it is interpreted the way that you behave as an emperor will be negative, meaning you could be a tyrant. Um, they may treat someone unfairly or take advantage of the citizens to act selfishly and put people at risk. This sounds a lot like what Leona did in book two, right? And what Scott did. Um, they may treat people unfairly, take advantage of their position for their own material motives, or put their citizens at risk due to their actions. With this meaning, we can interpret Leona as the emperor, of course, but also the unfortunate citizen. So. Starting with the most obvious, Leona is the house runner of Savannah Cloud, ruling over the rest of the dorm students, making his position similar to that of an emperor. Um, Leona's behavior in book two, he orders Ruggery to injure other students from other dorms, putting the, those students at risk, and even Ruggy as well, since he was using unique magic multiple times in a short time span. If you don't believe that put Ruggy in danger, well, think about that one time he literally grabbed Ruggy <laughs> and used his unique magic on him, literally trying to make Ruggy turn into dust. He also puts uh, Savannah's Claw's reputation at risk because when people found out about his plan, defeat and he overblotted it and then uh, Carly came in and he's like, hey man, you can't participate. He was about to tarnish Savannah's Claw's reputation as like the athletic dorm. However, when we dive into the past, we can see Leona is the victim under the Emperor with how the staff treated him and how his parents neglected him and his efforts. It just seems really, really sad. Also. Long fact, did you know the Emperor and Empress are kind of like a pair card? And, you know, it's just kind of like a side note, but Leona and Bill did have a dual magic with each other in their dorm cards. So it kind of seems very fitting to have Emperor and Empress as Bill and Leona. Also, I just feel like the interactions between them, <laughs> they're really funny. And so the Hierophant is Ruggy Bucci. In the reverse position, it represents sloppiness, it represents corrupted priests that doesn't really follow the correct morality and viciousness and probably like abuses morality to take advantage of weaknesses through hypocritical behavior. In other words, someone who's corrupt. Ruggy, I wouldn't say he is corrupt, but he, Sometimes, but he gets what he wants, right? He lies to people, he deceives people, he follows Leona's bidding, right? And he does what Leona asks him to. And sometimes what Leona asks his, him is basically uh, very bad. Example, book two, Leona told him to throw people down the stairs and that's what he did. <laughs> um, he's very tricky, he's very sly, he's really good with his hands and is able to steal things from people. He's very intelligent with his word. He's able to get out of situations. Examples are like in like book three in the event of a masquerade with Jamil. They're both very cunning and he's very street smart and he's able to get out of sticky situations many times. I wouldn't say he would follow a rule book. If anything, he is not following a rule book. He's very rebellious. He's very unconventional, especially with the way that he eats food, right? He, he, he ate dandelions. <laughs> so that's very unconventional. He doesn't really conform to the ideal type of NRC students. Most NRC students, I don't know if they mention this anywhere, but I'm gonna I'm post it like on here if I do find it. But I remember uh, reading like either NRC students are like really, really smart or really, really, really rich. Most uh, NRC students come from like a really good background, like being like a very honorable student or from a rich uh, place or such. And uh, Ruggy did, wasn't really coming from a background like that. If anything, he came from almost nothing. And honestly, I feel like this doesn't really fit Ruggy, this card, but I really didn't have anywhere else to put him. So this is where he ended up. There are other some interpretations that he is the fool instead but I feel like that fit Ace way much more better. The Lovers is Jade Leech. Lover is a pleasure card. When it's in the reverse position, it can be interpreted as one drowning in pleasure. Too much pleasure, right? When I think of drowning in pleasure and Jade, I only think about his, his obsession with mushrooms and also I think of him taking pleasures and torturing people and honestly, it doesn't matter who. He even tortures Azul and chooses his favorite food to be octopus and make sure Azul knows. Like he, that man is terrifying. You know, Azul, 
he's very powerful on his own, right? He makes contracts, but without Jade, he wouldn't be able to make most of the contracts that he does. Is the one who's doing the blackmailing, right? He's the one who's going out of his way and scaring people into signing the contract, or even retrieving people, scaring people into like meeting Azul. Jade may be addicted to the bad pleasure of um, making deals, which is enjoying it from the bottom of his heart and doing dangerous things. And when he does these things, it seems like he's enjoying it from the bottom of his heart. Like he's doing these dangerous uh, blackmailing things with no problem whatsoever. I would, I would, if like, I feel like if Azul wasn't in NRC, he would still be doing this. <laughs> There's like no contract. He's just torturing people just to torture them. And I feel like that's why he sticks around as well so much, because he's like, ah, I can get to torture people, that's fun. <laughs> Alright, so the lover's cards, you can see Adam and Eve. They're just standing there, and uh, there's a tree behind them, and the woman has a snake coiled around her, and it bears a red fruit. This kind of fits Jade as a card, because like, look at this card. It feels very, like, very nice at the first glance, right? Kind of like Jade. He seems like the nicer version of Floyd. At a first glance, right? But when you get to know him and when you get to see the little tiny details, you realize that he might be even worse than Floyd. As a side note, speaking of forbidden fruit um, and it being an apple, the apple could be a pell and the snake could be Jamil, so maybe they will have a, a certain uh, scenario with uh, a pell, Jamil, and Jade. Maybe in the future we'll, have, we'll see that. The next is the Chariot. The Chariot is Ortho, and the Chariot is an energy card. So in this card you see a young man who's probably looking straight ahead at his destination and is riding a chariot pulled by a black and white sphinx. Sphinxes express different emotions, and controlling them without reins will require a great mental strength. Alright, uh, the small red top drawn on the front of the tank can be said to be a symbol of instability. Once this tank starts moving forward, it cannot stop. Overcoming fear and hesitation and controlling momentum are keys to using large amounts of energy correctly. In the reverse position, this card may be interpreted as someone who cannot control their energy and go completely berserk. I could think of a couple of moments where Ortho would go berserk, or his brother, of course. I could see these sphinxes represent his love for Idia, and the other one is his love for chaos and uh, not a care for humanity. I mean, whenever Idio is missing or like not in the picture, Ortho tends to really go out of control. Like in the ghost marriage event, for example, um, Idio was missing and he was captured by uh, the bride and nobody really wanted to help. So he was like, okay, nobody wants to help. My brother's not here to control me and say this is wrong or right. So I'm gonna blast everybody into little bit of bits and pieces since they're not helping. Goodbye! <laughs> right? And even in um, book seven, Idia lost uh, Lilia as his gaming partner, and Orthos like, don't worry, I'll dox him for you. And, and Idia's like, no, 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 that's not, let's not do that. So the white sphinx I can see as Idia, and the black sphinx is his nature when Idia's not around. And if the white sphinx is not around here, then the uh, carriage will go uh, berserk. Uh, his love for his brother can be too much sometimes, like for example in book 6, it caused Idia to overblot because um, his love was, love for his brother was like a bit too much and he was like, oh, come on, let's start, let's restart the world together. So I feel like this card really suits uh, Ortho since he's uh, a literally a newborn basically with uh, all the information in the world and that can cause a lot of chaos. Next up is Strength, which is Rook Hunt. So Strength is a card that literally means power. And since Rook is someone with um, light magic, we're going to be taking the upright position for this. And the upright position means inner strength, bravery, compassion, focus. Basically, it means someone who has the ability to be patient uh, and can wait for the other person patiently until they can communicate with them properly. In this card, you can see a ferocious lion being tamed by a weak woman who communicates with her heart, right? The girl is able to communicate with the lion with courage and love, therefore the lion is somewhat tamed, right, and seems to be on her side. There's also an infinity symbol on top of, her, of the woman's head. But uh, in a way, 
I feel like the compassion that this card uh, talks about a lot is something that Rook has a lot of. The way that he sees beauty in everything and I think that helps him able to see things in many different uh, point of views and it makes him understand people and I feel like he can talk to anyone and anything because of that. Does anything actually scare Rook now that I think about it besides losing his friends? Uh, he's very a very courageous person now that I think about it. I cannot see him as a coward at all. I always see him as somebody who's smiling in the face of danger, and he probably likes the thrill of it too, uh, if we remember what happened in the Beans Fest event. Also, his unique magic, I see you, it definitely can mean as somebody who like sees through all the faults of somebody and is able to like connect to them in a deeper level. And that way he can communicate with them easily because he sees through what is at surface, right? Okay, the Hermit. The Hermit is a card of inquiry and guidance. And this belongs to Lilia Van Ro. In their first position, it means loneliness, isolation, someone who's lost their way. And in the card, you can see uh, a very old man walking and traveling. And it seems to be in snow in the very cold area. And the Hermit is someone who is used to travel, and having gained a variety of experiences, uh, he distances himself from the worldly and devotes himself to investigation, facing his inner self, past, and experiences. He's like 700 years old, so the description of a very old wisdom, uh, old and wise man is very accurate. Like, Lilia has so many back in my day stories to tell. Also, because of their extensive experience, they may guide someone. In the verse position, it can mean not being able to accept who you are now and you're clinging to your past glory. This, again, has to do a lot with Book 7, especially in uh, Part 2. Uh, Lilia is not able to stay with Silver and Sebek and Malleus in Book 7. Not being able to accept that he is weak and he can only rely on others to take care of himself and see him in a weakened state. He'd rather run away and uh, to a far off land and retire alone. Um, he absolutely clings to his past. I mean, have you seen his room? Um, he also was once a royal guard who served in Briar Valley and uh, he performed activities that would earn him lots of medals of honor and uh, he was featured in textbooks in the history of magic. He also gives a lot of wise advice, not only to Silver and Sebek and Malleus, but other students like um, Leona <laughs> in the future. I don't know what this card holds for him or Lily in the future, but um, hopefully one day he will be able to face himself and that, you know, it's okay, it's okay. Just because you're not at your prime it doesn't mean you can still do what you like and still be with your family and friends. We don't know what Lilia's unique magic is yet. Also, we don't know what Lilia's unique magic is yet. But if I had to take a guess based off this tarot card, I would say it had to do something with looking into one's past or have the ability to travel back into time. The Wheel of Fortune is Deuce Spade. Wheel of Fortune... Um, it's basically a fate card. The Wheel of Fate, which is surrounded by uh, scared bees, cannot be controlled by human power. It is controlled by fate. Fate means that if it is in the upright position, it will be turned around. And if it is in the reverse position, it will be toyed with. Meaning it, you have no control and you cling to the control and you have like a lot of bad luck. Since Deuce uses uh, dark attributes in his magic, his fate will be toyed with. Deuce, contrary to Ace, admits that he is an inept at everything he does. It seems that he was acting mischievous before enrolling at NRC because he couldn't get results like other people, even if he tried as hard as others. The only good thing about him is his physical physique, right? He's very good at uh, gym class and fight class. And we also know that Deuce is a bit of a delinquent. Before enrolling at NRC, he was never an honor roll student because he couldn't get results like other people. So. You know, he's like, okay, why try? If I couldn't be good as somebody else, why try? So in the reverse position, the Wheel of Fortune also has the meaning of spitting around in vain and wasting effort. So I feel that applies a lot to Deuce's uh, history and is uh, what he feels about himself in, in his past. His unique magic, Bet the Limit, is something that you can use in poker as well. Um, so it could really relate to the Wheel of Fortune in a way because luck is required to uh, bet the limit. Also, Deuce is like 
one of the main characters that hangs around a lot with MC. So he definitely, his fate is to be destined for something more uh, later on in the story, which is pretty cool. Now, Justice, Justice is silver. So Justice is a balanced card. Um, and we're going to be interpreting this in the upright position because he does use light attribute magic uh, whenever he casts his void. Yeah, so basically we see a king here and he has a sword in one hand and the scales on the other hand. And we'll judge those who have done wrong without mercy with the sword he holds in his right hand. So the upright and reser reserved positions are interpreted depending on whether or not your emotions are involved when you're when it comes to making these decisions and if you're in the right position you'll be able to have a sense of calm righteousness and no emotion the only thing relating this to silver is the sword in the card and how people think he's inspired from the sword of truth so, uh, instead of uh, from Aurora, which um, the Sword of Truth, by the way, it's the sword that the prince in the Sleeping Beauty uses to defeat Maleficent in dragon form. So it could mean that in the future, uh, Silver is somebody who will have to discover the truth and, you know, uh, about his past and uh, his relationships. And he has to face on them with uh, no emotion and do the right thing that... Uh, nobody else can do except him so i don't know what that means <laughs> but uh that's what i uh, i am getting from my in this interpretation of this card you know maybe we'll see later on silver serve justice in book seven and maybe with his unique magic i have no idea we haven't we have no clue what his unique magic is by the way the hanged man is jamil viper the hangman is a patience card, so you can see in this card a man is hanging upside down and he's unable to use his limbs and is in a truly helpless state, but his face is not contoured in pain. On the contrary, um, there's like a halo over his head. It looks like he's enjoying it, I don't know. He may be able to look at a situation very calmly and he finds himself uh, whenever uh, this person finds himself in a truly hopeless situation. In the reverse position, however, it means frustration and not being able to accept this helpless state and struggling to do something about it, but still suffering because there is nothing you can do about it. This relates exactly to how he is shackled to Kaleem in almost every aspect of his life. His family, relations, his friendships, his career, his literal freedom and accomplishments all revolve around Kaleem. Everything he does is for Kaleem. He cannot have his own freedom and that is his fate because he was born into a family that is enslaved to the Asim family. He is helpless about his position and fate. In book 4, he tried to get out of the situation but ended up in the same place. He didn't even get expelled. Just back to where he started, which is working under Kaleem all over again. His unique magic is kind of like the hanged man. He puts others in a helpless position, right? When controlling their minds and demanding them to act in certain ways. And right now, I feel like in terms of character development, Jamil is kind of stalling, right? He isn't really uh, doing anything about a situation. He's not really forcing Kaleem to look at the reality and he kind of like he kind of gave up right he's like well this is my life now might as well make it you know make it easier and just do whatever i need to do because i hate my life and all that <laughs> so depressing my god i really hope the Kaleem and jamil thing gets sorted out eventually anyways um what was i gonna say oh yeah um he he's stalling basically right now um and that is one of the key words for um the reverse position of hangman but maybe in the future in terms of character development it will go to the upright position and he'll develop some good feelings and he will sacrifice Kaleem <laughs> and be released from the shackles of having to serve him for the rest of life i don't know what that means for the future but it definitely i definitely feel like it would be for the benefit of both uh, Kaleem and Jamil essentially because I cannot see them together unfortunately as much as Kaleem wants it there's no way they can have a healthy relationship with each other right now as 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 it stands I mean they did have that moment in like book uh six where like Jamil's like you know what here let me teach you how to do this so you can take care of yourself instead of relying on me Idia Shroud is death death is an end card right and you know and he has a lot of a death motif. You know, he has a skull instead of a book or a magic pen whenever he attacks with his dorm SSR or his uniform card. 
He's inspired by Hades, who's literally the god of the underworld, right? His unique magic is related to opening the underworld gate, and he's so pale he looks like he might as well be dead. <laughs> and his blue lips don't really help that case. It's a scary card with a scary name and picture, but if you look closely, you'll see that the morning sun is rising. There is no night that never ends, and when the night ends, a new day begins. So the meaning of this card is that beyond the end, there is a beginning. Rather than death, it indicates a break in the relationships with people, the current environment or condition, and a break from a certain feeling, right? A new beginning in other words. When this card appears in a tarot reading, it means that a fate you cannot escape is just around the corner. If you are in the upright position, you can accept your fate and move on to a new stage, but if you are in the reverse position, you are not able to accept your fate and you will never be able to move on to the next stage with the way you are right now. Just like how he was not able to accept Ortho's death, he felt it was his fault, he was driven into immense guilt and could not accept his fate to the point he created a humanoid robot to fill the hole in his heart. In book 6, Idia did have to face Ortho's death again. <laughs> oh my god, imagine dying twice. God. Um, by the way, can Twist please stop doing that? It would be really cool if all the characters like stayed alive. Anyways, basically this, I feel like this card described book 6 very, very, very good. Idia was uh, faced with grief and he was not able to move on from that grief and then after all the incidents after he overblotted right after he was forced to see Ortho in the underworld gate going to heaven <laughs> he was uh, he had to eventually face the fact that Ortho's not here anymore right and uh, that's not that's something that's never gonna be changed and um, you know he started a new, new beginning. By the way, by new beginnings, remember when he picked the chip up and he like rebuilt Ortho again, but this time he's like, you know what, you're not Ortho, it's okay, you can be your own being. And he literally created like a whole new species of that, so it puts like a whole different meaning to a new beginning. Temperance is Trey Clover. Temperance is a reaction card. So this card comes from the Latin word meaning mix or bind. It depicts an angel transferring from one cup to another. And the act of transferring water is the very basics of alchemy and composition. Also, one foot is on water, which refers to the subconscious mind. And the other foot is on the earth, which refers to the conscious mind. Depending on the position it is in, one can either react by accepting mixing things or rejecting the fact that you can mix things. So Trey has a relatively gentle personality and is the type of person who doesn't often say what he thinks. Even if he's angry, he doesn't show it, right? He smiles despite being really pissed. Like, I can think of a very recent event, the Zoom event with Deuce. He was smiling at Deuce even though we was hella pissed at him. The only time he ever refused anything was actually in book one. He was unable to accept the fact that he had to tell Riddle that what he was doing was wrong. He was unable to say, Riddle, you need to stop beheading people. It is wrong. It is not right. You are in the wrong. He, he refused to look at the reality of um, what Riddle was doing to Hearty Blue. And until um, he was able to uh, accept that, and face Riddle head on when he overblotted, that's when he was able to accept Riddle for who he is and accept his past and accept that <laughs> leaving Riddle alone was not his fault, right? He was just a child. What he did and what he, what Riddle faced and what Trey faced and what uh, Chenya faced was all due to um, the trauma that Riddle's mom inflicted upon them. Another perspective you can take a look at this card is um, you can see Trey as the angel that controls the reaction itself. In book one a lot and, and other honestly in, in so many other vignettes and events and such, he kind of is the person that resolves a lot of disputes and controls the reactions between Ace, who stole the tart, and Riddle, the owner of the tart. He, you know, uh, he quietly worked with Ace to create like uh, another tart to give to Riddle so Riddle could forgive him. Obviously that backfired. But he's the one who made that plan, right? Um, he also quietly worries about Cater, who doesn't really open up to anyone else and keeps his feelings to himself. He's 
doing his job as the dad of the dorm. He manages and helps control the situations between extreme characters and personalities in Artsy Blue. You know, and also kind of a stretch, but like the angel is kind of doing alchemy here, and he is part of the alchemy club, so I feel like that is like another connection to uh, Trey. The devil is Floyd Leach. <laughs> so the devil is a temptation card. Honestly, at first, a lot of people usually like switch the interpretations. Either Floyd is the lovers or um, the devil card. And we could definitely see Floyd as someone who is the lover cards because he often really surrenders to pleasure a lot right he just does what his mood does or whatever his mood tells him to do right if he's happy he'll do it if he's sad he won't do it anymore um he always seems to be seeking pleasure but i chose jade to be the person who uh is the floor lover card because jade is often usually the one who's smiling and does uh really not so good things while smiling and i feel like floyd is more like very obvious whenever he's doing something really bad and I feel like that aligns uh, the devil card. In the card you see a man and a woman depicted and there are to be Adam and Eve just like the lover's card but they are succumbed to temptation and of the serpent and ate the forbidden fruit but neither of them seemed scared or confused. So you can see here uh, Adam and Eve have fell into the temptation of eating the forbidden fruit and they're not really scared or confused even though they're shackled chains and but like the chains are like really loose um so they could like run away at any point if they really wanted to also the devil in the background has legs of a bird the wings of a bat and the horns of a stag and an absurd combination that makes no sense this is said to represent the state of confusion and is interpreted to be the image of the devil as a frightening thing that causes chaos and destruction right um, in the upright position, it suggests that you will succumb to temptation and end up binding the other person or that you will fall together with the other person. But in the reverse position, it means you'll overcome the temptation and break off the corrupt relationship and start a new relationship. It means to be reborn through a new encounter or life. So Floyd is a moody demon, right? <laughs> he always seems to be driven around by temptation and I feel that the reverse position doesn't really apply to him. The card Devil itself has kind of relates to his unique magic, bind the heart. The heart is bound and shackled chain. And you can see Adam and Eve, who were captured by the devil, have been shackled, right? And they also have tails showing that they have become assimilated with the devil. It seems that both their mind and body are bound. This tarot card has very similar composition to the lover, which is the opposite of Jade, and I feel like choosing this card really fits Floyd in the, in the relationship with Jade, and it just seems fit for the twins. The tower is Sebek Sigol. Tower is a destruction card, um, and it depicts the tower that has been built up until now has been has been destroyed by lightning. Two people are being thrown out. One is like a person with a crown, and the other one uh, seems like a regular person. This means that what you have been built up until now suddenly collapses due to a sudden accident. However, one of them continues to wear the crown even though it is palling. It, mean, it also means that even if your accomplishments you have achieved crumble, your power will remain the same. So, I'm sure if you noticed, it's lightning. At least, this is the only card uh, in the major arcana that features thunder. Um, the origin of Sebek is said to be thunder. Um, that Maleficent manipulates. Also, the groovy card that he has is Thunder, so I think um, that evidence is pretty strong. And he talks like <laughs> like Thunder, he's very loud. By the way, the upright position for this card isn't really positive in terms of interpretation. So the position determines how fast everything falls. And then in the upright position, everything falls apart with a single blow, like immediately. But in the reverse position, it gradually falls apart. There is also an interpretation that in the upright position, accidents and troubles have strong negative impact in your life, whereas in the reverse position, it represents a positive impact, such as uh, getting a breakthrough. So who is throwing the thunder? It can be interpreted as he himself doing it, Sebek, or it could be Malleus, who has the power to actually cause thunder and lightning. The person with the crown, I feel like, can be no other than Malleus, because Sebek has such a strong uh, relationship with Malleus, and it seems that like Malleus will soon rule one day, and Sebek will be his knight in shining armor, and Sebek is of course the person falling next to Malleus. It could represent the relationship with Malleus or his admiration for Malleus will fall apart gradually. And but remember, this is in the 
you know, upside down position. So it will represent a positive impact on Sebek, right? It's going to be a, big, a breakthrough for him. And Sebek will be on equal footing with Malleus or see him as an equal. And instead of being a draconian, uh, he will see Malleus as a best friend, mate perhaps, or just a regular friend and and possibly stop putting him up on a pedestal. And of course, yelling at other people to respect and bow down to Malleus when they're in the same year will stop. This is kind of like a prediction in book seven that the thunder could be um, Zebek or Malleus, since Malleus has um, the power to actually cause thunder and lightning. It could be a prediction that in book seven, Malleus or Sebek will break the relationship between the two of them and Sebek will no longer see him as um, the great lord or someone that he admires and will have to face the reality that hey Malleus is just you know a lonely guy and he deserves to have someone to be his friend and not like a fan so yeah I feel I feel like this card uh, really aligns with uh, Sebek and I feel like this card will predict a lot um, for what will happen in book seven okay so the star is Cater Diamond. The star is a hope card. A star that never disappears no matter what happens means strong hope and a goal that you can keep aiming for. You can see here a woman holding two cups and the part with, uh, with one foot touching the surface of the water is the subconscious and the other foot touching the ground is consciousness, which is just a connection with uh, temperance, which is Trey Clover. In the reverse position, the star is at the bottom, which means the loss of hope, right? And um, discouragement, and it also means uh, there are feelings of discouragement and insecurity. Um, relating to the relationship that he has with Trey Clover, since this card is a duo with that. Um, and he could be feeling very insecure with his um, uh, relationship. Him and Trey are not as close as uh, he hopes uh, they are, and he feels like uh, Riddle and uh, Trey are more closer. Um, it may be a sign that the hopes you had were, were too high and could not come true, or that you were betrayed uh, even though you believed in them. Yeah. And the small card here, and then you can see in this card it has like um, a really big star and then tiny tiny little stars. So the big star could be the original cater and the tiny little stars could be uh, the split card, uh, his unique magic which is split card and so it, it could be his, uh, his other clones. I feel like uh, in the reverse position a lot of uh, the keywords in the reverse position relate to um, cater's uh, actual feelings and his actual personality which um he feels like he has like no hope <laughs> he's very depressed right he's disappointed in himself um and such uh, he's just, he's really disappointed that he can't have um that he can't have like a lot of friends and such so yeah um disappointment can lead to feelings of helplessness and uh, pessimism um about his future and cater who continues to be stubbornly close stubbornly uh, and Cater, who continues to suddenly not like open up to other people, uh, may have uh, such feelings. The moon. The moon is Jack Howell. Um, it is an ambiguous card, so under the dark light of the moon, everything appears as vague and a vague outlines. Um, the lines between the right and wrong, reality and fantasy, imply ambiguous states. So the waxing and waning the moon is also a symbol of instability and may represent indecision that has not completely given up on anxiety, doubt, and fear. So the moon is a card that has a better meaning when reversed than upright. So this is this is good for Jack Howell, okay? In the upright position, uh, you can be completely immersed in illusions and are unable to face reality. But in the reverse position, um, slowly as the sun rises, the vague outlines become clearer and you can begin to see reality. How Jack believed uh, Leona and looked up to him and then meeting him and realizing the reality of how Leona is actually a depressed little kitty. Specifically, it is an image of seeing through lies and true nature, exposing evil deeds, and bringing out things hidden in the shadows into light. And there's also interpretation that it means that something that was vague becomes clearer and that you're able to come uh, into terms with uh, reality. Um, in book two, Jack uncovers the evil deeds of Leona and Ruggie um, by eavesdropping on them one day and, and then he decides to work with the prefect 
uh, with MC and the other boys and to help uncover the truth, right? To help stop uh, Leon and Ruggie from committing their evil uh, deeds. Um, the reason why I picked this card and not like Judgment or something like that because I don't feel like Jack is a very kind of justice person, right? At the end of the day, his uh, is uh, also he's not like um, he's not really like a good person per se. He seems to be like a gray neutral. Like he's not gonna step in. It's none of his business, right? If something bad happens in front of him, he's not gonna go out of his way to um, put a stop to it, right? It's just you know, he's like ah, oh, well it's none of my business, and he keeps keeps on with his day. So I feel like this. Um, I think he cares more about the truth. I, I really do. I really think he cares more about like the truth and being honest rather than uh, doing what's right. And uh, this card uh, definitely depicts that. Next is the sun, which is Kaleem Alessin. The sun is a happiness card. And what better uh, person to pick for happiness is none other than Kaleem himself. So the sun is also a symbol of the cycle of life, which is guided by singling the beginning, uh, the beginning of the sunrise and illuminating the world. And also in the card, we can see a child <laughs> riding naked on a horse, and it evokes a kind of like a sense of innocence and at the same time a promise of safety. Um, despite his upbringing and being uh, kidnapped before, um, he still seems to keep like this air of innocence around him. Like he still is very naive um to the world and like he truly believes that jamil um and him are friends and whatnot despite jamil saying no like a million times right um in terms of safety it, he as a character memorizes uh he memorized well what is poison and what is not and he's able to tell you like off the bat especially like in book five you can see this he's like oh that's poison <laughs> right away and like so nonchalant also, he's always protected by Jamil, so there's always a sense of safety surrounding him. Um, happiness, success, and optimism, a vitality, joy, confidence, and truth. This is all what represents um, the sun card. And Kaleem does have happiness. He's always smiling. Um, success, he, he has everything he's always wanted. His family is very successful and very rich. Everything always worked out for him because he had Jamil um playing uh always like downplaying himself and always getting second place so Kaleem could have first place and a bunch of he had also a bunch of other servants helping him right optimism in book four he still let Jamil be around despite um the betrayal like he's optimistic for Jamil uh, uh not betraying again right um and uh in terms of truth Kaleem I'm gonna be honest poor baby <laughs> That baby is not able to face the truth, right? Um, the only time we got to see that was during book five. Um, and uh, we got just a tiny little bit of character development um, where he had to face the truth of like, oh, wow, Jamil was the one who was letting me win this entire time. And I never really earned anything on my own. And for the first time, I'm feeling uh, feelings of frustration because I can't win first place and with my own efforts and so you know that's a good thing that's a good thing right um so hopefully in the more future in the far in the near future we get to see Kaleem uh develop more and uh face the truth more often and face the fact that um a lot of who he is is shackled to Jamil just like how Jamil is shackled to Kaleem next is judgment judgment is riddle rose hearts so the judgment card uh kind of well stands for judgment um and riddle is the most judgmental person in twisted wonderland in my opinion so this card is very fitting to his personality um this card re represents the last day of judgment you can see which is prophesized in many religions you can see the dead people coming up from their coffins and rising up to the angel announcing today's the day of judgment and the angels announcing it with the trumpet so judgment um, uh, in the reverse position is, stands for like self-doubt. You have a strong inner critic. Um, you're ignoring the call, etc. etc. So Riddle is very harsh on himself and others, almost projecting the feelings his mom had on him when he was little to himself and others. 
Um, I think it wouldn't be a stretch to say that he self-doubts um, a lot if he has any real friends, especially with how he treated Trey and the others in book one. Um, I'm sure he doesn't feel that way anymore though, because he has developed a lot since book one. Um, um, he even faced his mother um, and was able to um, say, hey, what you did was wrong. Obviously, we don't know what um, what came out of that conversation. It was never discussed. Um, but it was just stated once in book four that he faced his mom. And that was it. So there's many interpretations for this um, in terms of position. But um, there's one interpretation and it says that if the card is upright, it means you're going to heaven. Yay! And if it's upside down, you're going to hell. So Riddle <laughs> might be going to hell. No. So this black and white uh, difference of whether you're going to heaven or hell reminds me a lot of how riddle treated people in book one um so if you did not follow the rules it's off of your head and you're going to hell but if you did follow the rules you get to go to heaven right which in the case is not getting your head beheaded i feel like this is how riddle lived most of his life as well his mother would punish him if he didn't follow the rules of being a stand studio's good boy and so he really, uh, I really feel like he viewed his life as, oh, he's going to heaven or he's going to hell based on what he did and what he didn't do. And um, in the upright position for the judgment card, uh, the keywords are reflection, reckoning, awakening. He was definitely reflecting on um, how his mother treated him and his upbringing and how he treats others around him. And I feel like he already had his awakening. It kind of like happened quietly, like off screen. But he definitely seems like a, a someone who awakened um, from his le uh, lack of self-awareness and ignorance uh, um, on the way that he treated others. And last but not least, the world is Malleus Draconia. The world is a completion card, right? Uh, the journey that started with number zero, the fool, right? And it ends with number 23, the world. And you meet various people, such as the priestess, the empress, the emperor, right? It's a journey. And you overcame many trials, such as the Wheel of Fate, the Justice, the Grim Reaper, right? And it was once destroyed by lightning that struck the tower. The world is both uh, a destination and a starting point for a new journey. Uh, uh, in this way, the fate forms a circle and continues to revolve, right? It's hard not to say the story of Twisted Wildland doesn't revolve around Malleus, right? He is the world. Um, he is the ending of the journey. He is book seven. In the reverse position, it just means unfinished. And it also means incompletion and there's no closure. And I feel like Malleus, uh, as a person, he doesn't have a lot of closure um, in terms of like uh, Lilia, right? Lilia is leaving him um, and uh, he did not say goodbye to him during the after party. He did not get any closure from Lilia that everything will be okay and um, he's not uh, gonna ever see Lilia again, sorry. Uh, uh, we don't really know about, about his past, but we do know that uh, his grandmother is the one in charge and uh, I don't think we ever met his mother yet or his dad. I don't think they ever talked about them, so I never, I don't think he ever got closure. And it can also be a sign of willpower too, this card, or lacking of planning, or as if something is supposed to be completed after a long journey, but it is abandoned midway through. So I feel like also, <laughs> Malice is not gonna get, um, Malice is won't, won't be able to see us uh, grow old because we're gonna leave him too. Um, so like everything is leaving Malice right now. Uh, a lot of his life, Many people left uh, his life, and uh, he spent most of his life very lonely, as Leia stated in uh, the part two, of the chapter. Um, just uh, like how the Malleus told us uh, in uh, book seven, part one, and he described that um, he was very lonely growing up, and a lot of people left him. A lot of people are le left him, uh, his mother and his father and uh, the staff <laughs> are very scared of him and now we're leaving him and Lily is leaving him now and uh, it's just uh, he had such a long journey and uh, it feels like he's getting abandoned right so let's think of the famous phrase here right 
The world is the completion and the perfection that the fool obtained at the end of the journey. The world is the last card in the Tarot Major Arcana. If you interpret it that way, the world becomes a perfect ending card. Um, this definitely fits uh, Malleus in terms of the role that he plays in the story and uh, the way that uh, the, the feelings that he has. I wouldn't say his personality. I think uh, the feelings, the feelings of loneliness that Malleus has and he has to face. And hopefully, after book seven is all said and done, um, the card will be upright and he will have a feeling of fulfillment, a harmony and completion. And um, completion for us too, right? Because the book will end. Uh, the main story will end there. Or overbots will end there. And we get to go home! Yay! <laughs> well, that's all the theories I found interesting. I limited it to my top 10 that I personally thought were like very convincing or believable. As I didn't want to add too long of a video. And this video is already too long. So, um... And as I'm recording this, I realize the video is going to be long regardless, <laughs> regardless whether I limit it to 10 or not. Um, so thank you for watching till the very end. I really appreciate it. Um, please leave a like and comment down below. Maybe sub if you, you know, sub to my channel if you really like me. Um, <laughs> um, I think I will do a future video too with more theories that include book seven as well because literally as I was recording this video, they decide to announce uh, book seven updates for the EN server. So that's great. That's dandy. I love, I love, I love this. <laughs> Um, so what theories do you agree or disagree with? What theories do you think I should talk about next? And what are some of your favorite theories that don't have JP spoilers? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll see you next time. Bye bye!